called Revolution uh, Tag Team. That was the new name of our church, Revolution Church. We need a new attitude. We need to look at everything and say it's not working. I need to do it a different way. So we've been looking at some um, really great topics in Scripture. Can you turn me down just a, just a hair, please? Some great topics in Scripture. There's, there's a lot more than what I'm going to mention. Uh, I'm just giving you kind of a top ten. But there's more. There's so much more. There's thousands of things we can learn. Uh, but we've been going through the Bible, and we find out the marks of the Christian. Now, let me just say this. You don't, it, it's not that you have to do these to be a Christian. Okay, just let's never, ever, ever forget you're saved by grace. Okay, it's what Jesus did on the cross. You say yes to that, you're saved. Okay, you don't have to do these things. You don't have to be humble. That's not a prerequisite to be a Christian. You don't have to value human life to be a Christian. You don't have to uh, honor sex the way God has told us to, to be a Christian. Okay? You don't have to treat money the way he's told us to, to be a Christian. You have to embrace Jesus Christ and his work on the cross to be a Christian. But when you are a Christian, you should embrace these things and live them out. You see the difference? Okay, so that, that's what we're going to do. Now, tonight's no exception. Let me just tell you what we're going to talk about tonight. Just going to be very open on this. This is what we're going to talk about. Two things you've heard of a million times. We've got to get our brains wrapped around this. Because if we're going to be a church that's called Revolution, we need to engage God in our effort. It can't just be us, you know, digging in our heels a little bit more and working a little bit harder at this thing. We need God to do it, so we need to do it His way. He's got two massive gifts for the Christian that he wants us to utilize to get that revolution done, okay? And it's prayer and repentance. These are basic Christian fundamentals, but we have to go over them because we kind of brush by them because they're so old school sometimes, right? I mean, we've heard, we, I, I just feel compelled to pray. I, I mean, I don't know about you, like some of us are better prayer than, prayers than others in the sense that we'll do it more, we take it more seriously. Some of us only do the obligatory before we go to bed or before we eat. You know, everybody's a little bit different, but don't you just feel compelled to pray sometimes? Like, you ever hear like a, an atheist say, I'll pray for you? You know, it's like, oh, I pray that doesn't happen. And I'm like, you're an atheist, dude, what are you talking about? But people just have this thing, like, we're going to just pray. It's kind of like a, a habit. We don't even know what we're talking about when we do it. It's just in us to pray. And because it's so common, we don't treat it with the weight that it deserves. And so I want to kind of, uh, I want to give it the weight that it deserves. And the same thing with repentance. These are massive tools. Okay, so um, a couple weeks ago, uh, maybe it was last week, I, I, I said this, that every person realizes that the world's jacked up. You guys all agree? Things are jacked up, right? And so, but we want to fix it. We want to do something to make our life better. And, and maybe if you're like a superhero person, you want to do something that makes everybody's life better, okay? But we want to, we want to fix it somehow because we all know it's messed up. So we throw money at it, we throw self-help at it, we throw Oprah at it, you know, whatever we do. But we want to do something, more career, more money, more sex, more drugs, more rock and roll. Whatever it is we want to do that we think is going to help make it better, we do that. And most often it just doesn't work. It just gets more and more and more painful as we go along. And so I quoted something last week where it says that the righteous is through faith that the righteous will live. Okay, the Christian will live by faith. And, and in Rome, everyone was talking about their faith. Remember, Paul mentioned that. Everyone around the whole world is talking about your faith in God. That's the way a Christian will live, in faith, in Christ. Dependence, trust, love, worship of Jesus, not other stuff, right? That's the way a Christian will live. But that leaves it open to being the reverse of true, that other people that aren't Christian, they won't live by faith. They'll live other ways. So there's lots of different paths, right? You can choose whatever path you want. It's your life. You can do what you want with it, right? So, but let me give you this verse here. Okay, it's going to throw a wrench in it. Give you this. Uh, Proverbs 3. Can you bring it up? Let me see. Boom. Look at that. First try. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And there's your page number, okay? This is what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. So let's just kind of open this thing up. Let's unpack this verse. There's all kinds of stuff in it. Okay, first of all, it would make sense that a Christian should trust the Lord. Makes sense. That's kind of sophomoric information. Nothing new there. Uh, with all your heart. The, the great commandment. 
is to love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. So there's no surprise there. Now, but this is different. This says, do not depend on your own understanding. And that's kind of wacky because here in this country, we, we pursue education and vocation and, and we want to learn all kinds of stuff so that we can fix stuff. The biggest seller in the bookstore is what section? Self-help. Self-help. It, it, it's, 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 it's this thing inside of us that says, we can fix this. I can fix my problem. The world's jacked up. My life's totally jacked up and can fix it. But meanwhile, this is what God says, total counterculture. This is the revolution we're talking about. You look at the landscape, it's all wrong. He says, do not depend on your own understanding. And so he says, uh, seek his will, seek the Lord's will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. So remember I said, everybody can take whatever path they want. You can choose the self-help path. You can, you can choose the money path, the career path, the education path, the music path, the drug path, the drinking path, the sex path, whatever path you want to take. You want to lean on the government for your happiness and joy? You can. This is saying, I'm going to give you a different way. I'm going to give you a different way. Like, there's all different ways for us to live, but he says, if you will seek my will, I'll give you the best path to take. Okay, that's what he's saying. So let me ask you this. Where's the best way to find, to seek out God's will? I've got, I'm giving you a hint. The Bible. Yeah, the Bible, right? The Bible. This is God's word. His Holy Spirit inspired people to write these very words so that you would know his will. Last week I mentioned to you, I think it was in Ephesians 5, chapter 5, maybe verse 10. It says, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. And how do you do that? Right here, right? Right here. But, but, listen, the reason why we're talking about prayer is that this Bible, although it's awesome, can y'all say awesome? Awesome. Like it's awesome and perfect and speaks to every area of your life, but oftentimes the lessons of the scriptures are very broad brushes. They don't speak to every single minute situation that you're in right now. Right now. So if we're going to seek his will in everything that we do, we have to be well-versed here. We need to know what the Bible says. But then, what do we do? We have to use one of the gifts he's given us. We pray. We pray because we, need, we read this, right? And we're like, well, you know what? I'm just not sure. And this specific, because he says, to, to seek his will in all you do, every minute point of your life, right? You need to find out what he wants you to do in every situation. So how do you do that when the scriptures aren't clear? The Bible says don't kill anyone, right? That's pretty clear. Don't lie to anyone. That's pretty clear. But in other situations, like should I take this job or this job? Should I take that gal or that gal? Should I buy this house or that house or this car and this car? And you know what I'm saying? So in those little details, what do we do? We pray. And you ask him. It's a massive tool that he's given you to use so that you know the best path to take. If we're going to have a revolution, we got to go on his path. You can't keep doing it yourself. It doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work. So, and I believe uh, in, in the Bible when Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, I'm the, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You have this thought in my mind, I don't know about you, but when I think about that, I think about the vine and the little grape at the end, and I'm the grape. You know, you're the grape. And, it's, and grapes are yummy and they're juicy and plump and shiny and wonderful, right? But if you take it off, it just starts to shrivel up and it dies. Is it still a grape? Yeah, but it's a yucky one, right? So apart from it is that lifeblood that's just going into the grape. And guess what? You're the grapes. You're the grapes. Some of you look like raisins. <laughs> But, 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 you're, but you're grapes, right? You're the grapes. I just got that one. It was really good, right? You're the raisins, and so you need to stay attached to the vine. So I'm fully convinced that when Jesus said, stay attached to the vine, I believe it's prayer. I'll tell you why. Because anyone can go to Walmart and buy a Bible. They can read it all day and night. I believe a single thing. You know what? They're not talking to God. They're reading a book. They're reading a book. Like, to the non believers it's like nothing. They're reading a book. They're reading a book. They can read Mother Goose. It doesn't make a difference. They're reading a book. But when you pray, there's real, live interaction. See, 
Pastor Billy Graham, he, has a, he says it perfectly. He says prayer is just simply this, a two-way conversation with God. See, when you're reading a book, which way is the conversation going? From him to you. But when you're praying, it's both ways. Now you've got a thing going on. You've got a relationship starting here, right? And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pray to seek his will in all that we do. Now that means individually. And then here, you're part of a family now. So corporately, we need to, I am so guilty of this, we need, we need to be a church of prayer. We have to pray better. I don't, and we're going to try to figure out what better means. What does prayer look like? What's it sound like? When do you do it? Okay, all that kind of stuff. We want to, we want to unpack that tonight. Now, let, let me start with a, a quote uh, from this dude. His name is Andrew Murray. Some of you know who he is. Some of you don't. Guys like John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Spurge, all these old school great pastors. They wrote books, 1800s, 1700s. You know what I'm talking about. These guys you've never met, but good stuff. This guy wrote uh, Absolute Surrender. It's a, it's a book. Uh, it's in the pile there somewhere if you want to read it. It's supposed to be a good one, although I didn't read it. But he's a famous theologian, famous pastor, famous author, multiple books. He says this, and I love the quote. He says, we must believe that God, in the mystery of prayer, remember that, has entrusted us with a force that can move the heavenly world and can bring its power down to earth. Down to earth. Now, prayer, I think it's important to God. Before we dive into what this guy's talking about, I, I think it's important to God. Let me tell you why. In the scriptures, the word pray is mentioned 313 times. Do you think it might be important? It's probably pretty important that God would see to it that it's repeated 313 times. Now the word prayer, an additional 109, okay? So over 400 times we're talking about prayer in the scriptures, so we just say that it's important. It's very, very important. Now, let's talk about what Andrew Murray said for a moment here, okay? I think that the most important part of what he says is this whole thing about a mystery of prayer. I would venture to say, and you don't have to like bark out your answer at me, but I would venture to say that nobody in this room or nobody in any room can fully tell me what prayer is, how it works, what it sounds like, how that thing works. It's kind of, it is mysterious. It's mysterious. It's all you can do is know that sometimes you pray, it doesn't work. Sometimes you do, and it does. And, you know, we pray for people, we pray for things, and sometimes it works. Sometimes you like, what, how, why, when, you know, what must not be this will? You still don't get it. It's kind of like creation. God spoke, and it was. Can you give me a formula for that? I mean, there's no way, right? So there's certain things we just don't know. It's a, it is a great mystery, this prayer. But, but there's, and the reason why it's a great mystery is because there's so many different results that occur in prayer. As a result of prayer, right? As a result of prayer. Um, in, in, in Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 4, you don't have to go, it won't be on your, on your list. There's a section of scripture where, where it says this, and, and, and the prophet is speaking to God. He says, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, and the, the mountains would quake in your presence. So we all know that God is everywhere, right? But there's a sense that he's, he has a stronger presence that is kind of like his throne, like where he hangs out mostly is in this place called heaven. Anyone know where that is? Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know if it's on that cloud or that cloud. I don't know if it's a, a place, a realm. Uh, I don't know, because like it says in there that nobody's ever been to come back. So I don't really know. But he's in heaven, but somehow, some way, there's a sense that if you could just come down and be with your people, everything would be different. And in prayer, that's what happens. It says, and remember what he says? He says, we must believe that God in the mystery of prayer has entrusted us with a force that can move the heavenly world and can bring its power down to earth. Somehow, the heaven and earth can that happens because when you pray it feels good doesn't it Amen. Yep. even if nothing is solved when you pray oh that you get better oh that you get better right and you don't get better but when you get done praying man it's good don't you Amen. it just feels good why Amen. God is close when you get your big brother with you when you get your daddy with you it just feels good and safe and secure and snugly right so when you when you pray you just know that heaven got real close to earth it's private, your eyes are closed, it's quiet, and God is so 
close. And you know, I got used to you. He's not any closer than he was before you closed your eyes, but it's just the way it feels. Somehow, someway in prayer, this thing happens. It's the same thing as ripping the heavens and coming down and being with his people. When you pray, he's right there, man. It just feels good. And someone says, hey, you pray for me? And you pray for him. What do they always say afterwards? Thanks, man. I feel so much better now. Did the cancer go away? No, but I feel better. Why? God was right there. And it just feels so good. That's what happens. Heaven and earth get close. But I don't understand how that works. There's no algebraic equation for it. There's no scientific formula for it. It just is. It just is. Well, why is it that when people pray, wars were won? Why is it when people pray, jail doors swung open mysteriously? Why is it when people pray, dead people rose? Why? Tell me how it works. You get the same answer I got. Oh, just does. You, and it just does. It just does. You know what? It's a tool. It's a gift. You know what? People that aren't Christians, they don't have that. They can just kind of. That's it. That's all they got. They can drink it away, shoot it away, smoke it away, sex it away, spend it away, whatever you want. But they can't do, they can't engage the one who could fix it. Prayer is awesome because it puts you in a place where someone who's bigger and better with more resources who can get the job done when you know you can't, you engage him. And it gives you some, at least it gives you hope. Hope that you didn't have before you prayed. Amen. It's good. It's a good, good, good tool. I want to take a sidestep for a moment, give you another quote. I guess it's old man quote night. <laughs> okay, different subject, kind of, and it's this. Uh, people... People fight about prayer. Christians fight about <coughs> prayer. Can you imagine that? They fight about prayer. They fight, we fight about everything. We even fight around here. We're all stupid. Do you know that when you fight about it, it doesn't change God? Like, we're all wasting our time. My way, no way. His way, dude. How would I spite you? How about that? It's his way. You know what I'm saying? So we shouldn't even fight, but people fight about prayer. You know, you don't have enough faith, you got to do it this way, you got to do it that way. Uh, let, let me just share with you. This is Charles Spurgeon who said this. True prayer is measured by weight, not by length. A single groan before God may have more fullness of prayer in it than a fine oration of great length. And you get before God... He's on your face, and you're crying, and you're just like, oh, God. like no one can understand what you're saying. God can. Because he already knew the thought before you, you try to like, oh, out of your mouth. He already knows what's going on in your heart. You know what the prayer is for? It's for you. He already knows what's going on. He already knows how to fix the problem. Okay, when's our camping? What's the dates of the camping, Dan? I'm fine. What's the date? Okay, got that? If you want to go, see Dan before you leave. Okay, so he, he already knows what you need, and he's waiting for you to put <laughs> it out of your mouth so you can get blessed. And we're going to jump into that in a moment, but let me just tell you this. When we're talking about prayer. We're being negligent to address what prayer sounds like. You pray better than me. No, you don't. We all pray. We all have the ability to pray really well. Okay, prayer, if you read Jesus' teaching in the New Testament about prayer, it's just going to be summed up like this. Do it to the point. Not drawn out, not fancy, so everyone will praise you and say, oh, man, he is super holy. Mm -hmm. You don't need to pepper it in with, like, all kinds of King James. You don't have to pray in King James. So everyone goes, mm -hmm. I can never do that. I hope you can't do that. Just tell them what you want. Just say, Dad. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not even going to say, say, I'm not even going to tell you what to say. But just whatever your voice is, whatever, like, have reverence because he's God, right? He's the creator of the universe. But, like, you just go to a friend or your father or your brother or sister, just talk to him that way. Right? He just wants genuine. Can we just be, that's what we want to be. We want to be a genuine group of Christ followers. Just read David in the Psalms when he's going to God and the next moment he's praising He's yelling at him, why did you forget 
Jenny, and then the next page, you're awesome, I love you. Just genuine, that's what he's looking for. Okay, that's what he's looking for. Now, let me, let's go back to this whole mystery of prayer. This is where it starts to freak me out. And I don't really understand prayer that much, I'm just to be honest with you. If you come in here tonight saying, you know what, the pastor's supposed to have all the answers, you probably came to the wrong church, I'm going to give you what is going on inside of me as I'm reading this stuff, and I want you to fish through it and find some answers, okay? Find some answers. But this is where it gets really, really mysterious to me. I want to read this section of scripture because um, every, uh, everything I'm going to show you in the next few moments is just so different. Just so different, and you can't, it almost like you can't even put any sense to it, no order to this, you know what I mean? You can't put any order to this, but I think at the end, I think God's going to help us to wrap it all up. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay, we all know, I, I, well, I should assume that. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, if you read the book of Acts, you're going to see that he goes like basically through hell. Whipped, beaten, you know, uh, jailed, shipwrecked, starved, everything. Uh, because he's, he's, a, he's an amazing man of God, and he's boldly going across the, the known world just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, planting churches, uh, appointing elders to oversee these churches, going to the next city, pleading with the people, this is Jesus, this is who he is, this is what he's done, you need to embrace him. Well, people don't like that, so they whip and beat and all this stuff. He goes through all these trials. And, and so you get here to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, and you start in verse 8, he kind of summarizes a little bit to these people in his second letter to this church in Corinth, and he says this, uh, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. Like, that's the understatement of the century. Okay? It's beyond losing your car keys. Okay? It's beyond breaking your iPhone. He goes through hell and back. But he opens up the veil a little bit to let him know what's going on. He says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. Anyone ever felt that way? Anyone? Okay. And we thought we would never live through it. Do you ever feel like you're at the end of your road? Come on now, right? He says, in fact, we expected to die. That's real bad. But because we're in this situation, Paul says, as a result of this, we stopped relying on ourselves. Does that sound familiar? Lean not on your own understanding, but seek his will in all things. So Paul's like, yeah, man, I got it. I can't fix it. I need someone bigger and better with more resources to step in for me and shape the situation and change it beyond anything I can imagine. Every time God does something crazy in the major world, doesn't it just seem to come out of left field like, <laughs> And so Paul's like, as a result of the fact that I can't fix nothing, I'm almost dead, we stop relying on ourselves and learn to rely only on God, who raises the dead. Like, he's kind of like, if he can do this, he can help me. You know, he raises dead people. Okay, so his, 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 his uh, resume is really awesome, this God. He's like, I can depend on him. And, and he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again we have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. Now, here's the part that is mysterious to me. And you, he's talking to people in Corinth, and you are helping us by praying for us. I don't understand that. I'm just being very open to you. I don't understand that. I'm reading this. And I see that God absolutely helped them escape mortal danger and death. But somehow he's saying that the prayers of you guys over here are somehow assisting in this thing. That somehow, oh, he rent the heavens and came down in response to these people praying. Does that mean he was waiting for them to pray? See, I'm not throwing questions. Like, I'm not, this is not like a prepared thing here. I don't know. It's pretty kind of freaky, isn't it? Is he waiting? Is God up there going, I can do this, I can help them, but I'm telling you, Robert, you better pray to me, because if you don't pray to me, I'm not going to do it. I can't. Hey, here's the key. Here's the key. Pray. Pray. And somehow it's on you guys. See, I don't know. I don't get it. I just don't get it. It's a good, like, you could, you could spend 
all night we can talk about this. And we all, I bet you there's opinions right now all across the room, right? Opinions all across the room. Mm -hmm. They're valid. And you should come Sunday night and share them with people. I'm not going to say another word about this verse on purpose. <laughs> Just for that reason. You got an opinion? Who has an opinion on that? Don't be shy now. Who's got an opinion on that? Okay. Come on now. All hands. You should be here Sunday night. Share it with your family. Share it with me so I can maybe have a better understanding as to why me praying for you helps. I need to know that. But I tell you this, I know it does. But I can't explain why. I, I don't know. How to, look, look, uh, Chris Mansfield was out there on my motorcycle uh, just a few moments ago. You all know the, the situation with Christian, right? You all know he's been so sick, right? Okay, he went to the hospital back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for months, right? Sick as could be, they almost thought they were going to lose him. He's fine now, Amen. right? Look, but here's the thing that's awesome, right? The doctors still can't tell you what was wrong with him, right? That's what I'm saying. But I know, I know who, who's been in this church where I stood here and we prayed for Christian. Right? How many people have prayed for Christian on their own? You don't have to show your hands because we don't want any praise for each other. But how many of you prayed for Christian? How many people saw it on Facebook to pray for that kid? So how many people do you think were praying for that kid all over? The doctors don't know what was wrong with him, but he's all better now. Why? I don't know. But it worked. Right? It worked. That's what I'm talking about. Like, I don't know how he, people are praying. country 
security is still jacked up. Why is he not listening? Same reason why in 2 Corinthians I said, I don't know, but it works. And this one here, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be working. We're still jacked up. Why? I don't know. Anyone have an opinion on that? <laughs> Look, everyone's afraid to raise their hand now. He's going to tell me to go around to table. There it does. Bold. Yeah, there's one. Was that a hand? Hey, that's two. Two, 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 and we got three. We got three. We got three. We got three. <laughs> No, chickens. Hey, you know what? I, I, don't know, I don't know how it works. Let me tell you this, though. We're supposed to be Christ-like, right? Who's supposed to be Christ-like in this room? Point at it. Don't you point at me. Point at yourself, right? Okay, look. Let me give you a couple verses here. These are, you don't have to look these up. Look. Luke 5, 16. Jesus often withdrew to pray. He is God. And he's still praying. Why? Again, I don't know. But he did. Do you all agree? You're Christians there, right? He's God with skin on. Like, he knows everything. He created out of his mouth. Before he became flesh and his spirit, he created planets. Why is he praying? I would just venture to say, I would just offer this to you, that he didn't really need to. He did it for us. To set an example. Right? This is how you stay attached to the vine, yo. you got to pray. And, uh, over here in Luke 22, uh, 39 through 46, you don't have to go there. Just You can write it down if you want. This is what happens. Jesus prayed, and he also tells his disciples to do the same. We are supposed to pray. Irregardless of the result, you pray. You pray because we're supposed to. Why? Because he said so? Will that work? I don't know. Sometimes it really works when you engage the, the planet maker. Did you ever, anyone ever read this, the book, The Circle Maker? You read it. I think you read it. I read it. Awesome book by Mark Batterson. I don't know where it is. One of you guys probably has it. If not, it might be in the pile. It's a, it's a story of this, this guy, Hani. He's an old Jewish dude but back in Israel, way, 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 way back in biblical times. And there was a drought in the land. And, and the story goes on. I guess it's true. The story goes on. And he goes out into the middle of the city, which was not paved roads then. It's just dirt, sand, you know. And he stands out in the middle of town square. And he stands out in the sand, takes a stick, and he draws a circle around himself. And he boldly looks to heaven and says, God, make it rain. We are your people. We are not supposed to be dying like this. Make it rain, and I'm not leaving my circle until you make it rain. <sighs> and it pours down rain. But having rained it so long, what happens? It floods, right? Because it's like hard. It's like rain on this, and it floods. He stays in the circle. He said, Lord, I did not pray for rain such as this. This will flood us. I want the right rain. And it stops and just goes to a nice, Mellow, steady, rain. Did he honestly believe that it was going to happen? Probably. But I'm a normal human being. Aren't you? Who's normal? I don't know you. Don't read that. <laughs> you know, it's just that little bit inside of you. You stand out there in front of everyone, and you kind of throw all caution to the wind, and you're feeling like, dude, if it doesn't rain, I'm up to creep. Pardon the pun. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, wasn't that, like, he was probably a little bit nervous, like, it might not rain. But he went out and he did it anyway, because he knew the only way to fix the drought was not self-effort. It was the one who creates and decides where the rain falls. It's the one in Job that says that he shouts at the clouds and makes it rain. And he knew that, and so he engaged this one who could bring rain. It's the same God that we pray to at 1 Kings chapter 18. 36 through 39. Just a, uh, you can go there if you want. I'm not going to read it, but the story is, is, is Elijah. A great story. He's up on top of Mount Carmel, and he's got, and he's, he's a worshiper of the one true God, the one that we worship. And then there's this fake God called Baal. Now, Elijah's a prophet of the real God, and Baal's got all these multiple prophets of the fake God, so they're what? Fake prophets, right? 
And so there's this challenge. He says, okay, this is what we're going to do. You build an altar, I'll build an altar, and then we will ask our God to send down fire from heaven, and whoever sends down the fire, that's the real God. So he's like, you ready? You ready? Let's get it on. And so these guys are dancing around going, oh, Baal, answer us. Oh, Baal, answer us. And they're cutting themselves, and it's just this crazy raid, and nothing happens. What does it say in that section? You can read it. It says that Elijah prayed and fire, wham, burns up the offering. He prayed. Might not have happened. He went out on a limb, just like Hani the circle maker, didn't he? Just like Noah, when he built an ark for a flood when it had never rained before. You just got to do it in faith. The righteous live by faith. That's what we learned, right? So we have to pray expecting that it's going to happen even though it might not. Right? James 5.16 tells us that the earnest prayer of the righteous man has great power and produces wonderful results. See, that's what the scriptures say, but I think what the problem is that we've never really stopped to define what wonderful results really means. Most people would equate wonderful results with what I asked for. Would you agree? Come on, spoiled people. I am too. Yep. I mean, we're praying all the time. Give me this, give me this, give me this. Fix her, fix him. Help them, help them. We pray away every sickness. No one should die. No one should die. We should just live forever. Pray it away, pray it away, pray it away, pray it away. So wonderful result means you have cancer, I pray it goes away. That will be the only wonderful result. Got to be healed. I think that's off a little bit. And, and because that's temporal. We, see, we, 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 we want to live. We want now. And God's like, I've been around for a long time. Before you were ever here, I'm going to be hanging out long after. You're in the crowd. i got big things planned. It's eternal. You're thinking about your 80 years, bro. Think about something a little bit different. Maybe you're not supposed to be cured. Maybe you got something bigger, better. I don't know. You got to get on page with what God's doing. And I'll tell you what happens. We learn that in prayer. But can, can God intervene in a situation like we what to define wonderful results? But we think that it's going to be what we ask for. And I'm saying it's not always that way, but can, can God intervene into a situation and change it completely? Can he? I think that he can. I think that he can. Uh, if you look at Matthew 7, 9 through 11, it says this. If you parents who are simple can give good gifts, how much more can your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask for them? When you're asking God, what are you doing? I'll give you a hint. Right. You're praying. You're talking to him. How much more? How much more will he give good gifts to those who ask for them? So can he change the situation? Can he wipe away the cancer? Can he reduce your debt? Can he do these? Can he save a marriage? Can he save a child? Can he do these things? You better say yes. Because he does. But will he always? No. He won't always. He won't always. But I know this. If, 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 if you've been a Christian, you probably got a story where he did. Right? See, I, I pray for stuff all the time. We all do. We all do. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But I can't, look, I can't explain why I prayed and my headache went away. I cannot explain that. I, I cannot explain how I went behind my dealership when I worked there crying and admitting my brokenness and my inability to be a father and a husband. And God, I need your help. And 20 minutes later, my buddy calls from Orlando and says, come to my office. I got 800 bucks for you. My partners and I decided to help you. I didn't tell him I needed it. Why does that happen? Because he intervenes. He intervenes and he responds to your prayer. Does he always? No. Why not? Don't know. I don't know. But I do know this. He did with my headache. He did with my, with my, uh, with my money situation. He did with Christian Mansfield. We prayed. He responded. He's healed. I don't know why. How many people have prayed for someone who's dead now? Come on. Yeah, it happens, right? That's sad. It is sad. But it's reality. But we don't give up praying because it didn't work. We, we continue to pray because it might. Because you can't save a life, but Jesus can. And so we have to ask him to and expect him to. And when he doesn't, be okay that he didn't. And admit, that was not the plan then, apparently, Lord, and I'm good with it. 
Get back on track with what he's doing. That's what we need to do. Prayer is, the prayer of the Bible, the prayer that God insists is very high. Very high watermark. Listen, here's three verses, okay? This is what he says. This is why we're supposed to do it. He says, 1 Timothy 2.1, pray for all people. Pray for all people. Everyone, even the ones you hate, pray for them. There's a reason. I'm going to get to it. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Pray about everything. So we're supposed to pray for all people. We're supposed to pray about everything. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Never stop praying. So there, there it is. This is what the Bible tells us. Pray for every person, every situation, in every moment. High watermark, right? Who's, who's done that? Come on. Nobody. Nobody's prayed for every person, for every situation, in every moment of their life. No one's ever done that. But that's what he wants us to do. And, I, and I'm just getting this now. I think that he's doing it because it gives him more opportunity for his glory. If we're giving every credit to him, when something happens, he gets more credit. If we pray about every single thing, nothing becomes outside of his influence. And he would receive glory if he fixes it. Okay, so that's what we're supposed to do. Every person, everything, every moment. Now, before we get unpack that, I said a moment ago that he can invade. He can change situations, can't he? You've got a headache, Lord, take it away. Boom. Anyone ever had one of those situations? You prayed for something and it just went, and he fixed it right then and Just raise your hand. People need to see it. Have you ever prayed to God for anything and he did it? Anyone? Raise your hand. Anybody. Okay, you need to see this is awesome. This is God at work, right? Okay? He can do that. But sometimes he doesn't. That doesn't mean it wasn't effective prayer. The reason I say that, do me a favor and go to Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Now, pray for all people is 1 Timothy. Never stop praying is 1 Thessalonians. But Philippians 4, 6, and 7 opens up. Some more, more information for us that you need to know. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Very, very popular section of Scripture. We all quote it over everyone else who's worrying about everything, even though we don't exercise it ourselves. Come on now. Right? Verse uh, 6 of chapter 4. Don't worry about anything. You want to give that back out? Whoever tells you you want to give them a forearm shiver in the face when they tell you that, right? I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, you see if you can not worry about it. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Okay, now how do we do that? It tells us. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Okay, so let's just kind of walk through this here. We're supposed to tell him what we need, so we come to him with our request. Whether it's for yourself, or, or you know what, Ryan, he's got a sore wrist or something, and hey, help him, right? So we'll pray for somebody, right? We do that. Or you need a financial blessing, or you've got a relational problem, whatever it is. We get people that ask us to pray all the time. So we sometimes pray for that person, we'll pray for our nation, we'll pray for our president, we'll pray for our wives, we'll pray for our kids, whatever it is, okay? Or we'll pray for ourselves, something. And so he says, listen, tell God what you need. So there's nothing wrong with that, right? And thank him for all he has done. Now, when you read on, does he say he's going to fix the problem? Does he say he's going to invade that space and make it better? Does, does he ever promise that there? So was it a wonderful result? I would say it's very wonderful. Even if he says, no, I'm not going to fix Ryan's wrist. Wonderful results. Here's why. So there's, there's, there's two people in the equation. I'm praying for Ryan. So there's him, the pray for, and, and the pray her. Right? What does he say? Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Then you, the prayer, me, Moses, the one who's praying, I will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. And God's peace will guard Moses' heart and my mind as I live in Christ Jesus. See, God 
is trying to build a kingdom, right? And so he's not just going to heal Ryan to show glory to himself. He's going to heal me. See, I might not like everybody. He says to pray for everybody. But as I pray for, name your enemy, as I pray for that person, all of a sudden, the bitterness and the hatred goes away. Because I can't pray for my enemy and hate them at the same time. So I start thinking like God. I start feeling like God. I start looking at that person as God does. He's starting to shift my perspective as I'm praying for that person. And I hope they're cured of cancer, but they may not be. But you know what? God's still building his kingdom right here. You see that? So there's wonderful result, even if your request goes ungranted. There's wonderful results. He's still working on people. It's just instead of working on the cancer victim, he's working on the person who's praying. Instead of working for that nasty, awful, you know, radical Islam who's blowing up buildings, he may not be working on that, but he's working on me as I begin to pray for that radical Islam man who's killing people. I begin to pray for that person, and he's building up love inside of me, Christ's love, the, the love that would willingly die on a cross to pay for that man, that ugly Islam, radical Islam man's sins. I have to be like that. And so as I pray for this person, he's building his kingdom in my heart. That's wonderful results. Wonderful results. Bless you. Christians just pray. And, and I think that in prayer, I, I just kind of draw this down, I think that in prayer, as we're praying, that's how God gets our mind right and keeps our mind right. If we're to be Christ-like, you have to stay attached to the vine. Pray to, to get into the vine and pray to stay on the vine to receive the lifeblood that keeps you going. You connecting? Let's, um, let's move on to the next one, and that is repentance, and then we'll be done. Anyone seen that dude who's now standing at the corner? Hobby Lobby, Eudora. Repent, Jesus loves you. You seen the sign? Come on, man. You see it? Yeah. Everyone loves the Jesus freaks, right? I love those guys. I won't do it, but I'll honk. Right? He's got the sign. Repent, Jesus loves you, right? Isn't the only problem with that sign? It's true, but most people don't even know what repent means. Okay, y'all repent. As soon as you tell them what it is. Like they have no idea. So it's kind of like a worthless sign almost. They have no idea what to do. Okay, I'm, I'm repenting. I'm repenting. I mean, you don't even know. So we have to, we, it's another church word. And nobody knows what it is. So let's make sure we know before we leave here tonight. It's another gift of God to the Christ follower. And look, it's a gift. It's a gift to everybody, but it's an amazing gift to the Christ follower. Let's define repentance first on a very shallow level, and we'll go a little bit deeper into what repentance really is. <coughs> repentance on the surface means to feel regret, contrition, remorse. You know, I feel like crap what I just did. I mean, let's just face it. That's what it is. I feel terrible about what I just did. It was wrong. Ashamed of myself. That's kind of the first step. Okay? The Bible talks about the first step versus what I'm going to tell you now. The next step. Here's the next step. You feel bad, but as a result of that feeling bad, something happens. And we turn from our sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. Kind of like like when the, the Bible says that when you're a Christian, you actually die and a new person's born, like a new person. So it's not quite what I'm about to illustrate, but kind of like we have the Declaration of Independence and we have the, the Constitution, but and that's the basic way we're going to live. But then we have amendments to it. Like we're going to make this, okay, we kind of tweak, we got to tweak this. We missed this one already, so let's get make an amendment and let's change the way we're doing things here. Okay? And so when we embrace Christ, we're kind of we're totally a new person. But you know what I'm saying? You guys, you're feeling it, right? You got you, you decide to make a change. And so sometimes we have to like realize we've messed up and say, okay, I need to get back on track and follow that amendment that I made. I, 
I made a choice back a few years ago to do things a different way, and I've kind of sidestepped, and I need to get back. I need to get back, okay? Now, there's a couple of different forms of repentance. Um, second, you don't need to write this down either. Second Peter 3, 9 simply says this, God wants everyone to repent. Okay? That's the universal shift. That's like every person across the earth, he wants them to say, you're not doing right, I got a way over here, come my way. That's what he wants. He wants everyone to repent. Say, wrong, I've been doing wrong, I don't feel real good about it, and so I'm going to turn to you, God. Okay? Uh, we, we've all gone our own way, the Bible says. And it's so very true. I mean, let's just be honest. We've gone our own way. And so he wants us to, to turn back to him. Uh, same thing, same verbiage, very similar idea. Mark 1.15, Jesus says, the kingdom is near. Real near, it's him, okay? He says, the kingdom is near. Repent and believe. So he's going to these people that are not God followers to say, okay, I'm right in your grill. Turn to me and follow me. This is the new way. You've got to do it this way. He says, turn from your ways and believe in me. Same thing, Acts 2.38. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. He used to be a chicken. Now he's bold. He's preaching about Jesus. All these people didn't know who Jesus was. And so he's preaching it, preaching it. And they're like, wow, I love that. I want that. What am I going to do? He says, what? Repent and turn to God. That's what we're supposed to do. Feel right about what you did, but let it lead you to turning to God. As a matter of fact, it, 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 you got, we've got to read this. We've got to read this. I want your eyes on this. Uh, Acts 17 30. Acts 17 30. Not on the list on the screen, but you've got to read this. Acts 17 30. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. As you change your perspective on the people you think are ugly and don't deserve it, and they're just so rotten and terrible, and we should, you know, end them. Uh, 1730 says, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone, everywhere. That's who? Everybody, right? He commands everyone, everywhere, to repent of their sins and turn to him. That's bold. That's not asking. That's telling you, you need to repent. Because the result is eternal separation from him in a very, very hot place. Y'all know what I'm saying. Okay? Pitchforks and horns. Okay, so he says you need to repent. Now, this is the universal shift. This is everyone on earth changing from the way they're living to the way they should live, following Jesus and embracing him. But... There's a different type of repentance that I want to share with you tonight. Because this, these first couple verses were the non-believers that should change the way they're living and go his way. Okay? Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, you can go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 9, I think it's up there. Um, you're going to see Paul, now he is writing, listen. He, before these other verses, these were to non-believers that should change the way they're living and turn to God. This letter right here, it is to believers. So he's writing it to people just like you and me, okay? People that already embraced the Lord Jesus as the Lord and Savior of their life. They're Christians. They're heaven-bound. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 through 10, it says this. Uh, let me see here. Uh, where, where am I? 2 Corinthians? Did I do this right? 2 Corinthians 7? Oh, wrong chapter. Okay. Yeah. I, he wrote this first letter in 1 Corinthians to this church because they were totally jacked up. He was trying to get them back on track. He was very bold in his writing. So he kind of feels bad a little bit at first, but then he comes around. He says, I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it. Not because it hurts you. See, he's not like this mean dude. He actually loves these people and wants them to do better. He says, not because it hurts you. He's not going, <laughs> he says, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. See the difference? It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. The kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin, you see the repentance there, and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of shame, of sorrow, 
But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, just feeling rotten about what you've done, what is that? What, what's the result there? Spiritual death. See, that's the difference between condemnation and salvation. Condemnation means I did something wrong, I feel like crap, I'm awful, I'm a terrible person, God will never forgive me. That's not what he wants. He wants you to get there, but leave out the God will never forgive you part. And go, you know what? I'm crappy, I did something wrong, I feel bad, but God, you love me, I'm so sorry. I don't want to do that anymore. Forgive me, move on. See, it's, it, it, one leads to condemnation. You just feel bad about what you've done. You start downgrading yourself. I'm worthless, I'm no good. He can never love me, he can never forgive me. No, 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 no. The Bible tells us that Jesus will never refuse those who come to him. Never refuse those who come to him. There's no sin that's too much. If you're breathing, he can save you. Okay, so look, godly sorrow leads to this. This, I'm sorry, it's wrong, but forgive me, help me do better, turn from that sin, embrace this amendment that you made. I want to live this way. I got off track, but I'm getting back on. That's what God wants for us. That's what God wants for us, okay? Um, now, how, how, let me just say this. This, this section here, this is not just a universal shift that you were totally in sin and going to hell, and now you've embraced Jesus and you're going to hell. That, that's the universal shift. That's for everybody. But this section, this is, this is to the Christian to soar higher and to have a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus. And, and listen, repentance is not something you did when you got saved only. Uh, the men here, we were listening, we watched this 33 thing the other night, and this one guy, I think his name is uh, Crawford Loritz, he said we should be living in repentance. Now he's talking to Christians, and I say this to you Christians too. We need to live in a posture of repentance all the time to know how we stand, to know who we are is healthy. To know that you're still broken, but that you're getting better, is healthy. You've never graduated. I'm a Christian now. I've got to figure it out. To have a healthy awareness of your condition is good. Now, so, so if he's called us to this higher thing, how does this kind of flesh up? How do we live this thing out? Well, I've quoted this many, many times. I think Kyle has too in his uh, time up here with you, but I want to go here with you. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. And it tells us how what, what's Paul talking about here? What does he mean, godly sorrow that leads to repentance? What does it mean that I should have a healthy view of my condition all the time? That it wasn't just a one-shot deal, and I gave it up to Jesus, and he fixed me, and now I'm better, and I'm good. I mean, that's not the Christian life. It's not the Christian life. Proper Christian life is found within the pages of this book, and it says this, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Just as, I'm going to read this again, just as you accepted Christ, how did you accept Jesus? You did the universal shift, right? Your way is not working, your way is much better, Jesus. I give up this, I turn to you, I'm humble, I need you, I need this bigger, badder guy with more resources. To fix my life, fix my world. I can't do it anymore on my own. I need you. Humble submission to Jesus. You repented of your way and you turned to him. And what this is saying is you need to stay right here every single day. That even though he's washed you clean and you're part of the family, look, you need to be in repentance all the time. Search my heart, oh God. I know I'm a Christian. I know it's getting better. But search my heart and find out places that are not good so I can repent of them and turn from that and go back to you. We have to stay in that posture of repentance every day of our life and take our last breath. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the Christian life. That's what a Christian does. Do you need to do it to be a Christian? No, but Christians do it. Okay? And that's healthy. If we're going to be a church that's leading a revolution, we need to be that type of people that are repentant all the time, searching for little nooks and crannies in our life that are still dark yet and need the light of the gospel to hit it so that we can change. And we need that because people are looking at you for real, authentic Christian Christianity that they can follow. And when there's dark areas in your life you haven't given up yet to the light, they will see them. 
And that's what they'll point their finger at. You'd be the greatest dude in the world, but there's one little thing that's dark. Yeah, but. Am I lying? No. We all get it, right? No. Good. We're, we're good folks here, pretty much, right? But, uh, but look, yeah, but. But you did this, and you do that, and you said this, and you wore that, and you said all the time. So we have to constantly be in this posture of repentance, asking God to search our heart to find places that need the light of the gospel. Okay? Um, here's our gift. This is how we exercise. This is how we flex the gift. It's so simple that some people don't even believe that it's real. Hmm. But it's in the Bible. Just like I'm God, don't put any of the gods before me, this one's in there too. And listen, I, 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 I'm ashamed a little. It's that godly sorrow though that I have to exercise this all the time. And I probably have to say this up here more than I should. But it's in the Bible. 1 John 1, 9. Y'all know this one? If you confess your sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And stuff that you do, you're like, hey, I can't believe I ate that nice cheeseburger. I shouldn't have. I did. I looked at her too long. I should have brought that change back, but I didn't. Whatever, the, you know, y'all got it. It should lead to repentance. And, and so what, what does repentance look like? It means God. This is what I did. But see, it doesn't matter how you feel or what you think. His promise is, if you, if you tell him, and you admit you're wrong, and you want to do better, he'll let you. It's kind of cool, right? It's a privilege just beyond your feelings or emotions. It doesn't even matter what you think. It's true. He, he said, if you confess your sin to me, not only will I forgive you, but all that guilt and shame that you're carrying because you did it, that leads to condemnation. I suck. I can't believe I did that. Lord, forgive me. He takes that away too. See, he doesn't think about it. I don't know what you guys are thinking about it, but I know that God doesn't think about it. So you're kind of wasting your time thinking about it. I call that stupid. Don't do it anymore. Exercise this gift. And, and, and so hopefully, as we're repenting, and he's pointing out areas in our life that are wrong, and we're saying we're sorry, and help us to do better, and he's cleansing us of all the unrighteousness and the wickedness, and we're becoming more Christ-like, sometimes we fall into a ditch and say, see, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I am a super Christian. Things are going well. I got his affections. He loves me. No, 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 no. That is still not what puts you in God's good graces. And now is a great time to tell you that no matter how good you are, no matter how many times you ask him to search your heart and point out the nook and cranny that's dark and ugly, and he shines the light of the gospel on it, and you change your ways, and you're repenting, and you're repenting, and you're turning, and you're better, and less sin, less sin, still doesn't make any difference. 1 Peter 1.13, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nothing that you do, no matter how much repentance, look, Christians repent. Christians, it, it, we embrace the light. But listen, that is not what puts you in God's good graces. Okay, all of us are going to be sitting here waiting. And the only reason we're going to go up there wherever that realm is up there on the, on the clouds with hearts, wherever that it's all because when Jesus comes back, he's going to gather us up no matter how rotten you've been. And you're going to go, how can he get in? He's going to grab him anyway. You know why? Because he loved Jesus. And he's going to take him with you. And you're going to have to deal with him in heaven. Even though you think they don't deserve it, you're going to have to deal with him because he's going to be right there by your side. And if they really don't, if you really don't like him, God's got a sense of humor. Guess who's going to be in the condo right next to your house? Him. And you're going to need to get over it. So you might as well get over it right now. You might as well get over it right now. Ephesians 2.8, it is by grace that you are saved through faith. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift. And guys, whoever's given up communion, you can go ahead and start. I want to close with this. This is Revolution Church now. Okay? This is Revolution Church. And God has given us tools for the revolution. He has given us the tools to change the world that we live in. And, and, and two of them are, are we've talked about tonight.
prayer, we stay attached to the vine of Jesus Christ. To, to know His will in all that we do, and separately and corporately, you stay in prayer with Him. You talk to Him, He talks to you, and listen, if He's not talking to you, it's because there's some sin in your life, you're misbehaving with your wife, you're sin, you have idols, whatever, cleanse those things away, fix those things, and He'll talk to you. And He'll tell you the best path for you to be on, like individually and as a church. And repentance, if you fail, if you fail, just turn from your failure, say you're sorry, embrace Christ, and say your way is right, my way is wrong, I messed up again, forgive me, his promises that he will. And I'll tell you this, prayer and repentance, it, it, it keeps our dependence on Jesus right at the forefront of our minds. And, and if nothing else is accomplished, that's a wonderful result. Keeping our dependence on Jesus. This one that when you pray to him, you're, you're acknowledging that he is God with massive resource and you can't fix the problem. It shows humility before God. It shows dependence upon God. It shows trust in God. That's why we pray. It keeps our dependence on Jesus at the forefront of our mind. It gives us peace to the person who is praying. It brings peace to the person who you're praying for when you're holding hands with them and you're praying. It brings them peace. It, it, it rends the heavens and God comes down and hangs out with the people that have been praying. And guilt and shame are just crushed in the presence of a perfect and holy God. So we have to pray. And we have to repent. These are the tools, these are the gifts that God has given us. Use them. God's going to come and lead us in communion. Thank you. Embrace 